We've got about, uh, I think, 275 people from all over the world um, that have registered for the webinar today. And it's just great to see that, you know, despite the lockdowns in so many countries, that people are still willing to learn uh, via educational tech or edtech as we call it. So uh, please in the chat box, I should say in the chat box, please tell us uh, where you're dialing in from. Uh, we'd love to know. Um, and thank you, Annalise. You did follow to, to the letter uh, my uh, slightly off instructions of where to actually say where you're from. So we've got at the moment, we've got Montrose, Victoria, Bank First. We've got Miriam Meyer, Guten Tag from Vienna. Great to have you with us. It's been a long time. Um, and we have Daniela as well from Mondi Group in Vienna as well. Fantastic to have you here. We've got Andrew Vine in Singapore from the Insight Bureau. Fantastic. Thank you for your email earlier on today, Andrew, as well. Uh, really looking forward to, to seeing the hybridization of conferences and events. So fantastic for that. Uh, Dave Rosenberg, my old mate from, uh, from New Zealand. Uh, great to have you on here We're from West Con Com Store as well. Um, we've got Elizabeth from Barara, New South Wales. I'm in Bilgola Plateau today. Uh, Barara, not far away. Uh, we've got some lovely folk from InvoCare in, uh, in New Zealand. We've got Moreton Bay. Uh, we've got workshop events out of Goldston, New South Wales. Human Synergistics, Justine Farrington. Fantastic. Bavaria. Uh, the Europeans are waking up. Mapadora, Milan. We've got Fabrizio Bozio. Nice to have you with us. You've been in the center of one of the massive outbreaks, and I hope you and your family are doing okay under the circumstances. Uh, Brett Tarlington, Bell Rose. We've got Essen, Germany. Chennai, India joining us at the moment. And uh, my good mate from Slovenia, Andrei Persin. Nice to have you with us. Uh, last time we saw each other was uh, virtually, uh, but uh, prior to that on Amway, 60th anniversary, uh, aboard a cruise ship going from uh, Rome to uh, Barcelona, where I got the keynote, uh, when conferences were still a thing, ladies and gentlemen. And great to have you with us, Michael Morgan from Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. We will be talking about uh, the left and right brain and cognitive thinking here in just a bit. And of course, from St. John Ambulance, uh, we've got Ulrika, or Ulrika Pantheon uh, from Perth and Western Australia so far. Thank you very much for sharing. Let me move forward, ladies and gentlemen, the second Renaissance webinar. Uh, and what are we gonna be covering today? Uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a historical, uh, spend a little bit of time on history and just look at how disruptive events around the world uh, have really shaped future rebirths and uh, future eras that have really seen humans flourishing and have maybe in the midst of all the darkness that we're experiencing at the moment, that maybe there's some hope for us as humans, as, as family members, as businesses and entrepreneurs, as partners, uh, as careerists, whatever it happens to be, right, as parents, to ensure that we position ourselves for the comeback because no doubt there will be one of those as well ladies and gentlemen and i should just say um beyond the ability to download all the slides ladies and gentlemen which of course you can do on bitly uh forward slash second renaissance that's 2nd renaissance and please uh have a 2nd and then a capital uh, r for renaissance bit uh, dot ly forward slash Second Renaissance. Uh, you can access all the slides from today, which of course will contain the top 10 trends that are emergent and maybe even amplified and accelerated courtesy of COVID-19. Uh, but we'll also share with you a more in-depth trend report um, and some other trend analysis tools that you can use with your leadership teams um, and your organizations as well moving forward. So make sure that uh, you share both the video of this recording, of this webinar, but also the slides and make use of them. Um, ladies and gentlemen, before we really get into today's webinar, um, I promised you in the invite to this webinar that we would do some backcasting. Uh, in other words, do some time travel out to the future uh, and look back on the journey from that future point in time back to the present moment. 
And the time I've picked, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, this little guy's birthday, his fourth birthday. Now, this is me and my son, Lucian, uh, Sulman Banning. Uh, and uh, this is us at uh, very near our um, little cabin in, uh, on the northern beaches of Sydney, near, uh, near Mackerel Beach. This particular rock uh, is called Champagne Rock. And we love to do some bush bashing and get up and knock our water tank out there in nature. Now, Lucian's nearly three. And the time in the future that we've set for this webinar to do some backcasting from, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's very personal to me, is the 22nd of June, 2021. So European summer solstice is the time travel date that we are going out to, ladies and gentlemen. It is Lucian's fourth birthday. And I want to kick us off with just a little future diary note that I have written to just kind of imagine what the future might look like when this little guy turns four. Uh, so if you, don't, uh, if you don't mind indulging me for a moment, um, let me have a little read of uh, what I've come up with. Uh, and of course, the relevance for all of you will become evident very, very shortly. Today on summer solstice 2021, our son Lucian turned four. It feels like we are emerging from a long hibernation. It is the first international family trip we have been or we've had since June, July 2019, two years. Even though some international borders reopened six months ago, the idea of being cooped up next to strangers in recycled air on the direct route from Sydney to London and onwards to my native city of Stockholm, somehow felt both unhygienic and also the luxury of international travel. Well, to see my, my elderly parents in Sweden felt a little bit tone deaf at a time when Western economies and the developing world had been seeing unemployment rates of 15 to 20% of the last 12 to 18 months. The US economy is starting to wake up and it's being powered at the helm by the newly elected, re-elected Donald Trump, who has awoken, amazingly so, to climate change and the profitability of the emerging green economy. In the wake of the Wuhan virus, I'm calling it so because of its provenance, a new awareness of the cost and risks of factory farming are becoming clear, and the beyond meat alternatives are soaring next to locally grown vegetables. Food waste in the supply chain is a thing of the past as depression era awareness of ensuring any money spent or every disposable dollar on food is optimized. GDP growth for the last year was down 15% globally for 2020. Last year was not the 2020 vision we had aspired for back in the good old days. Yet while the pure economic indicators were in the red, a new social and mental awakening had been occurring since the virus emerged in January 2020. Digital traceability found that the virus was synthetic rather than biological and had led to massive genomic and healthcare investments, including in biosecurity. As private citizens, we're all reminded each day, day while the first four waves of the virus had taken millions of lives, tragically, that technology adoption and rational responses to data like GPS tracking and wearable technologies combined with a new obsessive compulsive focus on germophobia were the best barriers against this and other now emerging superbugs. Aren't you happy they began today's session with a very inspirational speaker, ladies and gentlemen, right? In Byron Bay, Australia, anti-vaxxers 
anti-vaccine people, in other words, um, are now up on manslaughter charges and being convicted, just as religious leaders have been for being science deniers. And similar global sentiment is setting in against climate science deniers. Investment funds are leading the charge into a sustainable economy and, out, uh, and ousting directors and board members who are nostalgic for the old version of capitalism. Carbon neutrality and even climate positivism or climate positive businesses are the only ones getting funded. Meanwhile, B2C influencers in social media have taken a massive hit as they are seen to lack awareness of the economic privation that has beset a large part of the global population. And a new breed of digital heroes are emerging as mentors, people who mentor, coach, and help transform those in need to make the transition to the new eco economy. Home has again become the point of solace for humans. And with the right mental health support, the family unit is what keeps communities and villages together, both in analog and virtual realities. Local is becoming so good and giving that the idea of traveling somewhere else seems like a waste of our precious time on this earth. As we travel through meditation on our inner journeys and spiritual connection with ourselves and our loved ones become the new type of travel. As we all seek new answers for the future. On June 26 now, four days later, on Swedish Midsummer's Eve, a new season is heralded by my clients at Facebook, where Mark Zuckerberg announces via a hybrid Digilog event that Facebook and the physical planet is now officially open for business again. At the same time, my son Lucian blows out the candles on his carbon negative birthday cake and makes a donation to kids on the other side of the world whose families are able to use the seed funding to start sustainable businesses that help save our planet in the emerging fifth industrial revolution or in the second renaissance. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. That is my version for the future. Now, I'm not sure if you have goosebumps or if you've already logged off the webinar, given that crazy vision of the future. Now, this is not necessarily a prediction, but when I imagine what next year might look like or this year might look like, it sort of felt fairly uh, pertinent, right? Now, uh, Holger de Groot, thank you very much. Would love to see this happening. Uh, and Fabio Venturi, don't like the vaccination outlook for the sheeple. There we go. Uh, let's talk conspiracy uh, theories later on. But this might be the future that some of us see. Now, where do I get this crazy vision of the future? Let me give you a quick trend analysis tools. Now, some of you have, uh, have attended our scenario planning sessions. Uh, I'm gonna just play you something for a minute and a half to tune into how us futurists work and uh, the importance of scenario planning when we think about a point in the future that we can plan backwards from to also identify which trends will help buoy us into the future. Imagine the following thought experiment. You are the science fiction author of your own business, life and career. And you get to be the creative genius for your own minority report, your own avatar, your own man in the high castle. To do a pre-mortem as opposed to a post-mortem on your life's most important projects. You hold the embryo of your own future, no matter whether it's a dystopia or a utopia. You get to engage in a thought experiment that is scenario planning. The outcomes of scenario planning are to create four different alternative future worlds so that you can withstand future shock no matter whether dystopia or utopia unfolds. 
in an exponential world of change where change has never been this fast and will never be this slow again steep factors sociocultural technological economic environmental and political factors are drivers of change you need to identify you then need to select and decode the top two which can be visualized on a dimension on an x and y axis and which are the most disruptive and impactful for your future for example digital transformation or technological unemployment courtesy of artificial intelligence to create four different future worlds like digital dystopia, e-commerce euphoria, the devolution of trust and a human creative renaissance for example. In this thought experiment that is scenario planning, you get to be the creative genius that designs a better tomorrow. See you in the future. I'm going to launch another poll now um, just to see where we're all at uh, and which things during this lockdown that we miss the most. Which old luxuries are you most looking forward to post lockdown? Uh, is it having someone else cook for me at a restaurant? That one feels pretty right uh, for some of us. Sitting still with a keep coffee, keep cup coffee, easy to say, on the beach. A neighborhood barbecue, visiting elderly relatives, international travel, small breaks uh, from immediate family. Now we're cooped up with them all the time. Sometimes it's nice to get out and about and get a little mini break. Going to the gym or even a luxury like toilet paper because somebody else bought all of those. Uh, let's see, uh, which, in, which old luxuries are you most looking forward to post lockdown? Seems like international travel is, is one that is appealing to a lot of us. Uh, massive pent up demand, right? Uh, and who's coming second here? Visiting elderly relatives, yeah. Isn't that the right thing? And, and certainly for me, I know my, my elderly parents live in Sweden on the other side of the world uh, and international travel uh, is also involved in actually getting to them. Thank you very much for, uh, for those uh, responses, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to share those results with you as well so you can have a little bit of a look as well. Okay, let us get into this uh, and where we're heading to next. Uh, some quick helpful thinking frames as we move forward. Keep these five in mind. It's always better to do a pre-mortem as opposed to a post-mortem. A pre-mortem enables us to actually fix a problem before it occurs. Uh, and it's a version of events where we're looking back from the future again onto the past to think about things that might have gone wrong. Now, that might sound very negative or pessimistic, but it actually helps us avoid some of the uh, missteps that could lead to disaster. You're, just like me, a science fiction author. If you're a leader in an organization, you need to write your future plan, write your future narrative and imagine alternative different future worlds and make sure that you are prepared for them and that your strategy is uh, also agile enough to withstand future shock no matter what happens as we saw in the video just then. Trend spotting and scenario planning are really just thought experiments. Uh, think of it as a digital twin to the science experiment that we're all forced to live through right now. Now, as futurists, which is all of you on this webinar, we don't predict the future, but we can prepare for it. Now, I will make uh, some pretty, um, pretty pertinent and strong stances throughout this webinar today on what I think are the emerging trends and how we can thematically invest in them. Uh, so they're not necessarily predictions, but they are preparations. And finally, this time to slow down and being locked down could actually enable us some deeper thinking if we don't always get distracted uh, at home. Uh, and potentially there's creativity uh, within quarantine. So when we think about the future and the present moment in time, I think of this almost as a type of viral terrorism, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I want to give you an example of this and why um, perhaps terrorism is one of the best psychological analogies to what's happening on the planet today. Now, apologies if anyone has loved ones or family or friends that were impacted by the two events that I'm about to address, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I do think that the second one is a very heartening one. Uh, 
exemplifying how the future courtesy of technologies like the one that we're experiencing right now might be a better place, might be a more humanistic place, might be the place where a second renaissance is possible. Now, the truck on your window, the Renault, is the same make and model that on Bastille Day in 2016 was hijacked by a terrorist in this in France. He then drove that truck for 1.6 kilometers unimpeded, tragically, in the process, taking 92 lives, 482 people injured from that event, and many more families suffering the loss of loved ones and from post-traumatic stress disorder. The truck on your right, ladies and gentlemen, the Scania truck is a smart truck. Now, after a 2012 EU directive, which stated that every truck on the roads of the EU had to be part of the Internet of Things, it had to be equipped with very sensitive sensors and be equipped with an advanced braking system. Maybe foolishly or, or maybe luckily, the terrorists in the Berlin Christmas market attack of the same year decided to hijack the truck on your right, the Scania. Now, not after 1.6 kilometers, but with his foot still through human error, still on the accelerator, not after 1.6 kilometers, but after only 70 meters, the truck shut down the terrorist. In the process, less than 10% of the total carnage impacted uh, or created as had been done in Nice only a few months before. Now, many people around the world would say that, Anders, you know, the digital world we're all experiencing is so digitally dehumanized, we're physically disconnected. But if we start thinking about the digital world as potentially being one where there's less human error or deliberate human error, where there's less inhumane consequences as a result of that human error, well, what we're starting to potentially see is that we can code for humanity, code for more empathetic outcomes for our clients, our partners, our teams, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if you're a real cynic, you might say that in the future, ISIS won't need humans. They'll just send in the code instead, which is, of course, why cybersecurity is a trend we all need to be thinking carefully about and should also invest in to make sure that no Zoom bombing happens on this or other webinars. Now, why is terrorism an analogy for what's happening with this viral threat? Well, according to terrorism experts and um, authors, what these shocks do is that they affect our psychology in, in two primary ways. They ensure that as humans, as some people in the chat were saying, as sheeple, as herd people, we seek safety and we increasingly avoid risk, meaning that we abandon habits and we change our behaviors, our old behaviors. In our instance today, we may well be abandoning old behaviors, pre-COVID behaviors. And secondly, we have a heightened awareness of our own mortality and vulnerability. And maybe we make a decision right here, right now, that we want to enjoy our futures and our lives in a different manner than what we did pre the shock. Now, to tune you into where this concept of the second renaissance comes from, I would like to bring you back a few hundred years to the Black Plague, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, medieval Europe where at the heart of what became the Renaissance in Florence, half the population lost their lives to the Black Plague. In fact, a third of Europe's population lost their lives while the Black Plague was sweeping the continent. Now, if I reflect on the present day, I think that there is no better time to be suffering from a pandemic on a humanitarian on a planetary scale, given the technologies that are actually enabling us to corona-free still be able to connect with loved ones. 
if we connected face to face, we might be vectors of the virus asymptomatically or otherwise. Now, these types of shock, be it the Black Plague, be it the Depression era, which affected my grandparents in, in Sweden, uh, and of course, many of your forebears as well. I, I still remember my grandmother, Ingrid, uh, when sadly she passed away now 14 years ago. Um, but when she did, uh, some of the inheritance she left was, you know, frozen berries from the 1980s, early 1980s, frozen mushrooms. She kept everything in jars and she made sure that there was no food wastage whatsoever. When we grew up, uh, you'd get a little bit of milk in the glass. So you had to prove that you could finish it so that there was no food waste. Very, very different from other generations. Now, Simon, uh, Simeon Siegel, the managing director of BMO Capital Markets, says that many generational attitudes have been tied to singular events that, led, that leave their imprint psychologically on us. It remains to be seen if this is one of them, but it's not hard to imagine that the present pandemic uh, will be one of those singular events that shapes us in the short and long term. At the same time, the Black Plague, uh, and again, I invite you to go and study your history. Uh, I'm a history major at university, so I've had to dust that off just a little bit. I wanna spend more time with you guys today speaking about the future and future trends. Uh, but of course, the Black Plague, in its impact in places like Florence, really became the mother of invention. Half the labor force were gone. It led to a massive restructuring of economic power where uh, those who did survive, uh, and particularly those in the feudal societies who were workers, uh, actually had a bit of a premium placed upon them and could get out of poverty. Uh, workers and, and people and farmers in the field were becoming merchants and merchants were becoming noble men uh, and I would like to say noble women as well. Uh, there was a massive reshaping of society. And of course, it led to a flourishing of the arts, of politics, think Machiavelli, of the likes of Michelangelo and Da Vinci. And of course, there was a big focus on labor saving devices because there weren't as many humans available. So we can think about some of those analogies to the present day and what might be emerging in the near future. The CEO, Chip Berg of Levi's, says that the deeper the economic impact is and the longer everybody is cooped up, the more of a shock they will be to the system. And it may take longer for the consumer to come back, right? Now, we know that we have B2B and B2C companies represented in here today. And uh, some of the data shows, we've heard this said, right, that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. Uh, some psychologists are saying it takes 66 days to form a new habit. And in some countries around the world, we will be in lockdown for months. And yes, it may well shift our consumption habits. For example, in the United States, out of everybody today that buys their groceries online, according to the statistics, 40% had never ever transacted anything online prior to February. Yes, we are learning new behaviors. And I would say something like uh, online grocery shopping is definitely here to stay as a, as a new habit cross-generationally. And ask yourself, what are the new habits of your own customers, your clients, your partners, as they buy and consume and procure differently, ladies and gentlemen? Let's see if we can run a quick poll at this stage and, uh, and see how we're thinking about the future. Let's see. Stop sharing that one. And we're going to have a look at our next poll, ladies and gentlemen. Which habits do you think will stay? So we've talked about things that may not stay and some of the luxuries you might want back. But which are the new lockdown habits that you're actually likely to keep? Have a think about this. Uh, yeast is selling out around the world. Uh, are you baking bread? And if so, will that be a trend that's here to stay? Uh, some of us are becoming germaphobes in the process, right? We're sanitizing our hands. Um, some of us just like to drink a beer at home 
or a couple every day. I'm seeing some of my clients saying, hey, it's 2.30, it's okay to drink now. Uh, now, I'm not encouraging this necessarily, but hey, we know who's out there, right? Healthy cooking, quality activities with family, for example, your kids, your partner, family, friends, uh, to the extent that you can. What about just slowing down? Or maybe a reduction in business and leisure travel. 20% of you are actually thinking that that's maybe a good thing. Uh, meditation, 2% uh, are learning new things, right? Online learning like yoga and even participating in this format like webinars. And some people are just really loving the house party app. Uh, and uh, well, 4% of you uh, will keep that. And 1%, great, you're the ones that are buying up all the, um, all the yeast at the moment. 75% uh, of you guys have voted already, which is fantastic. 1% uh, uh, saying increased at-home alcohol consumption uh, will continue into the future. All right. Uh, make sure you talk to your doctors as well. Make sure we're investing in our mental health as well. We we'll share those results so you can have a quick look at those as well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, trend, the trend can be your friend. And of course, the way we work and the way we now transact is becoming different um, or differently, depending on your grammar. Now, a few years ago, as we set up for the trends that we're about to discuss, in 2013, the then Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, announced plans for a Distinguished Warfare Medal meant to recognize extraordinary achievements that directly impact on combat operations, but that do not involve acts of valor or physical risk that combat entails. For drone pilots and cyber operators, essentially, now, veteran groups raised hell about this. Uh, I'm from a military family on my dad's side in Sweden, uh, which is a great career move because we never go to war. Uh, although dad always reminds me he's done his bit with international forces in Afghanistan and Kosovo as well. Um, now, veteran groups raised hell. Uh, this proposal was killed off very, very quickly. Now, we have to remember that things and times change, ladies and gentlemen. It used to be that uh, snipers were considered cowards in military circles. But of course, these days, um, Bradley Cooper plays them in Hollywood movies. And we have to ask ourselves in a digital era that we're now forced into right now, the question is whether the battle lines need to shift, right? Analog to digital, right? The military battle lines have shifted today state and non-state actors send in the code first and then maybe humans or maybe other types of technologies. And the same is true for the way we work. Something like remote work is an example of how the world has shifted. Sadly, sadly for our family, my mum's little menswear business in Stockholm, Sweden, experienced in some ways the nail in the coffin during COVID. And sadly, they had to declare bankruptcy and voluntary administration a few weeks ago, courtesy of COVID. But the reality is that in some ways, the digital disruption that she as an analog person, very much viewing the analog battle lines of business and her, in some degree, failure to adopt digital ways of working meant that she had no supply chain left when COVID happens. No way to really truly transact with consumers who'd adopted new ways of working, right? This of course means that she hadn't embraced both of these two worlds of the analog and digital where they can coexist. And of course, if you want to find more information about my mom and her business and, and what she's going through, I've written a recent blog about um, the sad event of a 104 year old uh, family business now no longer being in business. Now, luckily for my mum, a, a silver knight stepped up last minute and, uh, and um, bought my mum's business um, and will hopefully retain the name George Sawman moving forward. But the pandemic is taking lives and it's taking livelihoods, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, the question we have to ask ourselves is how do we build sustainable brands and trust in a future where business and consumer confidence is now truly shattered and where our consumer values and behaviors may well 
have shifted. Now, we know that even pre-COVID, that consumer behaviours were shifting, right? It used to be in Sydney in Australia that the busiest bank branch in Sydney was on Castle Ray Street and was the Westpac branch. Now, courtesy of the adoption of new technologies like the smartphone, the busiest bank branch as of late, at least pre-COVID, was the 333 bus from Bondi to the city, right? Because people all have a bank branch in their own back pocket right now. And of course, cross-generationally today, people are now taking banking and financial matters into their own hands. Luckily, we have a standing desk, so I can change around a little bit. Now we all have a bank branch in our back pockets, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if you ask yourself, how will COVID impact this? You might ask yourself, well, are people still likely to be using the new technology or will they abandon the previous mode of transport? Now, I was speaking to one of our uh, clients the other day, a big tech company, who alerted me to the fact that now in China, because of COVID, the sharing economy is in dire straits. People are starting to distrust the likes of Uber or Didi, right? And amongst a non-car owning generation who'd previously just been into access, they're now seriously considering buying their own form of transport like a car because they perceive it as being more hygienic, right? So the question is what new trends are we seeing? Which new trends might actually go into decline and which might once might be void? Uh, this is the question we have to ask ourselves because it determines how we scenario plan for the future. And again, when you download the slides, which Jenny will uh, share the URL uh, in the chat in just a moment. By the way, if you have any questions for the Q&A later on, please do put them into the Q&A function, Q&A being different from the chat function. We'll have a look through those questions and I'm gonna do my very, very best to answer them or uh, just pose a really good political question back to all of you. Again, the scenario planning webinar, which we ran a few weeks ago, great precursor to the work we're about to do right here, right now, uh, is worthwhile you watching as well, where we really teach you how to become a scenario planner in a 12 step process. Again, um, it was so valuable that one of our clients in Japan decided to translate the whole, whole scenario uh, planning sheet as well. So it is now available in Japanese as well. Thank you very much for doing that, Akiko. Um, so let me move forward. Trends. When we do trend analysis, uh, the central tool that I use uh, in our business is called STEEP, uh, Sociocultural, Technological, Economic, Environmental and Political Trends. And they really sort of form a basis for the strong and weak signals that I and my researchers spot around the world. Uh, and they form the basis of the trends that we're about to discuss. Again, a great tool for you to use to just keep your finger on the pulse of what happens around the world today. Based on scenario planning, we've essentially created four different future worlds where some of these trends might be stronger or they might be weaker. And those four future uh, worlds, we call the following ladies and gentlemen. And I would suggest strongly that you prepare yourself for all of those four future worlds. The first one is the virtual winter, where there's a short freeze of the economy, maybe less than six months, and trust and rebuild with clients will all happen in the digital interface. The long cyber night is one where from freeze to thaw will take a little bit longer, maybe six months to three years. And again, all the rebuild will happen in the digital world. Hibernation, is where we're just going to hibernation for six to six months to three years. And the whole way that we're hoping things will go back to the nostalgic good old days of pre COVID and trust rebuilding happens in the analog world. And finally, business as unusual, a short recovery from freeze to thaw. And again, we're very, very soon going to be getting on those aeroplanes and having all meetings and sales functions in person meeting face to face. Based upon that, we've come up with the following trends, ladies and gentlemen. The first trend that I wanna address with you here today is the rise of 
hyper local commerce. Think about your own consumption habits, right? Back in 2007 already, locavore was the word of the year on uh, Google, right? One of the most searched words. And of course, the idea of the hyper-local is something that now appeals to us in an age where there is an increasing distrust of globalization, global supply chain, a distrust of will the goods be safe when they get to me? One of the only forms of commerce that's now been available to us has either been digital commerce or going back and supporting our local butcher, our local baker. These are all businesses, by the way, our local bookshop here in Avalon Village, for example. These are all businesses that have massively benefited from the fact that people want to spend locally and see their local neighborhoods thrive and be a point of contact. Now, the uh, locavore index of the strolling of the heifers also tells you which states in the United States, for example, where, where heifers have traveled the furthest or whether uh, the milk or even the meat that you're about to consume uh, is from the local area. And of course, food miles increasingly will be shortened, not just as a result of technological acceleration, ladies and gentlemen, but also because increasingly countries and states will protect their own local and regional uh, interests and really try to be self-sufficient. So one trend that you can all invest in and ask yourself how you can tap into is the rise of hyper-local commerce. Ask yourself, are you already a local board? The second trend that I believe is here to stay in a post-COVID world and will shape consumer purchasing behaviors is do it yourself everything or DIY everything. Now, this comes down to both practical tools such as you know running and participating in survival courses, uh, learning how to make a fire, becoming a prepper, but it can also be things like abandoning certain types of subscriptions and technological tools, uh, even cutting down on the amount of stuff you outsource. When we're thinking about efficiency, uh, are we migrating to tools like, uh, from my friend, uh, friends at Canva, for example, using tools like Canva to do our design for us um, at very, very uh, cost-effective rates, right? Even things like design now has been decoupled from professional designers so that we, even as hacks, can do our own branding and design. The idea of DIY or do it yourself is very, very compelling to people in tough times when we maybe cut down on our spend and want to learn new skills for ourselves. The other thing that's emerging, of course, is the inner sphere. When everything around us seems out of our control, the inner sphere through meditation, therapy, coaching inner journeys, yoga, and going on a transformational journey ourselves seems more compelling when we can't externally travel, right? This seems like something that is here to stay. And of course, trends like well-being, mindfulness, and just a healthier life, these are all things that I believe in the present day, but also for the foreseeable future, people will be spending increasing amounts of money on. Uh, we've also seen that a large part of disposable, disposable dollar at the moment is going to things like organic food. As people are trying to look after their bodies, treating their bodies as a temple. And of course, we have uh, you know, initiatives today where mental health is now also digitizing through the likes of Michael Phelps and his interest in, say, talk space. And uh, there's an increasing awareness and investment into uh, our mental health, both on a governmental but also individual basis. The other thing that's happening at the world in the world at the moment, and I believe it's also here to stay. Yes, some of us might feel a little bit of cabin fever, but everybody seems to be <laughs> building a moat 
around the private sphere or the home, the central hearth, the fireplace at home where we can storytell and interact with our loved ones is again on the rise, right? The uh, increase in just home entertainment, such as Netflix, for example, again, and other streaming services means we're spending more time at home and likely to invest in things like maybe home cinema uh, and technologies that help entertain us in the home. But this is not just for humans, of course. The other thing that you want laying across your lap or across your feet as you're in front of the hearth is a beautiful spring spaniel or a rottweiler, depending on what your preference is. And of course, we're seeing spend on pets or um, fur babies growing exponentially, not just before COVID, but also during COVID, where people are now uh, mass migrating to dog uh, shelters and the likes of RSPCA, etc., uh, to collect new pets um, for their homes and building very, very strong bonds. And of course, uh, our disposable income is gonna match that as well. Today as well, if you wanna get uh, a little bit of predictive maintenance on your human health, you can invest in things like 23andMe, but then of course, very, very conveniently as well on amazon.com, uh, you can team that up with, because people who are like you and wanna invest in 23andMe and, and the genetic sequencing uh, can also get the very, very same for your dog on wisdom panel. So you can match your dogs and study your dog's uh, DNA and their family history as well at the same time and make sure you feed them a personalized diet of only organic and locally sourced meats or maybe even beyond meats for your pet. We're putting back fifth trend, eco in economy. I believe that any brand interested in its future has to be sustainable. Um, already last, last year, we invested massively into my own business becoming carbon, uh, uh, carbon neutral, uh, even depending on which auditor you believe in, becoming climate positive, right? Actually sequestering uh, carbon from the atmosphere. Now, we have to ensure that we build businesses who are aligned with the sustainable development goals. And if it's not our teenage children from Sweden shaming us all into this, uh, I believe that we've all been learning to be extremely sensitive and attuned to the science during the COVID crisis and learning to actually accept science uh, and good science to make different strategic decisions. We're seeing uh, the likes of BlackRock now uh, taking very, very active measures in terms of how it's influencing uh, the boards and uh, the companies where it has interests to make sure that they uh, are becoming sustainable uh, and green at that. And I believe the green credentials of every company will really be um, under the spotlight as we emerge from the COVID crisis. Sixth trend, mentor and hero. Uh, we have seen that entire school systems in a matter of weeks have had to digitize all of their content. For example, in America, that was done in two weeks. Um, in China, students have been in lockdown uh, for months in certain parts of the country, like in the Hubin uh, province, for example, or Hubei province, I should say. Um, and of course, they're learning in new ways, including with AI coaches. And I believe there's an emergence at the moment of any student with an access to a digital interface can have the best mentor in the world. Uh, now, this might be your version of Gandalf, right? But any kid around the world today, be it at university level or elsewhere, now has, as an emergent hero, access to meetings with mentors and of course this is true also on a corporate level where you can access the best information from around the world either live or via recordings so the mentor and the hero meeting in a digital dance of mentoring and uh, leading you through your own challenges uh, according to joseph campbell's little hero's wheel here of the 12 stages of a of a hero's journey right uh, through life 
is something that people are going to increasingly have access to and people are becoming confident uh, as they're digitally adopting these new technologies. And of course, this is democratizing the access to great world-class information. There's also trend number seven, a massive re-emergence of slow. Uh, you know, the old, uh, the old uh, parable of the tortoise and the hare. Um, I got given as someone who used to travel a lot around the world, I got given uh, a train journey book from my fiance for my birthday back in March about train travel in Europe. Now, if it's hygienic, I'm totally up for it. Maybe it's a nicer, slower way of traveling. And a way of traveling and being that taps into a slower, longer term thinking as Nobel Prize winning economist Daniel Kahneman talks about. Pre-COVID, a lot of us were reacting and moving very, very quickly around the world, digitizing, socializing, virtualizing. Maybe this is a time to actually slow down and ask how the slow economy might be one that you tap into or one that you produce services and products for. Trend number eight, essence over status. Now, pre-COVID, uh, there was a sense of status or social media status anxiety. This is why um, some social media companies remove likes and other types of reactions because it was actually found to be linked to mental health uh, challenges for certain parts of the population. This is, of course, bad news for influencers who were using this uh, to commercialize their likes, right? Um, and I think we're going to see a massive shift from influencers just um, peddling stuff online uh, inauthentically uh, and showing off uh, certain credentials around the world um, to one that's more about essence. Today, the real heroes during COVID are essential workers, essential workers who are on the front lines. And there's even a shift in the way that we distinguish between blue collar previously and white collar workers. Today, we're distinguishing between essential workers and non-essential workers, which might actually mean that we have a reshift or a new paradigm around who's doing valuable work and my sense is that um, um, influencers who were uh, selling maybe just vanity on the surface uh, are not here to stay or will not survive uh, this shift in consumption habits and values those influencers might actually seem somewhat tone deaf if they continue along the same path and don't transform uh, their messaging moving forward. So it's going to be about the essence of people, their authenticity, their transformation, the, the journeys, their vulnerability as they move forward. Trend number nine, we are coding for a contactless humanity. And we're going to see an increasing, at least short term demise of the value of the human touch. I grew up in a family business, as I've alluded to, where you know the human touch was always heralded, right? A friendly human interface that smiled and you know sometimes even gave a little hug or even a little clap on the shoulder, right? A firm handshake. These are all things that are now um, socially uh, and, and certainly health-wise, you know, dangerous things to do. So in that moment, uh, we have to ask ourselves, how do we actually replace the human touch and how do we redesign our product and service offerings in a world where contact less and the rise of drones and even robots from an empathy perspective can help us deliver more humanity, more empathy. Ask yourself in a redesigned world, how can you use these technologies to actually seem ironically more human and humane because you're amplifying your humanity through a digital innovation like a robot or a drone, for example. Final 10th trend is 
connectography, big word, on the fringe. Now, uh, one of my favorite authors is uh, Parag Khanna, and this book is a few years old now, but he essentially argued that uh, that geography, courtesy of international travel and, and digital connectivity like Zoom, for example, meant that geography and borders were becoming less relevant. Now, borders are becoming more relevant again, but what we're seeing and starting to see is a shift internally in countries and in cities, even a type of de-urbanization as workers, particularly knowledge workers who are laptop jockeys can work from anywhere. In other words, you might actually see real estate prices on the fringes of cities uh, starting to go up again as people are thinking because of remote work that they become very, very comfortable with, that they're super happy to just live somewhere a bit more remote. As long as they've got good broadband, they will be able to tune into um, whatever client meeting that they need to, whatever sales meeting they need to. So there's connectography on the fringe. Ask yourself, what does this mean in terms of where you locate your offices, your shops, your logistics, your distribution centers, even in terms of what your OH&S or occupational health and safety uh, looks like for the future as people are increasingly working from home. So based upon that, what are we seeing as maybe a, even a mega trend, right? I believe that this new economy is the transformation economy and brands like Nike have understood this for years, right? It used to be that you could just have a commodity then, you know, maybe that were threads, for example. Then you turn that into a combined product like a pair of sneakers. Then you added maybe some services to those sneakers like Nike Plus. Then you turn it into an experience when you had, say, Nike running clubs or just had a great in-store experience in a Nike shop. Finally, though, uh, they position themselves as a transformation brand that teams up with their clients and their partners so you can achieve self-actualization. Now, I know, having shifted from running in Asus to Nike, that one of the reasons that they did that was that I started adopting some of their technology. And because of the fact that I was tapping into their digital software, I became more likely to buy the physical hardware. But I owe a debt to Nike for running my first New York marathon, right? Because it wasn't just about the experience or the service or the product or the commodity, but it's because they led a hack like myself, uh, an amateur, to run a marathon. And for that, I'm indebted to them. And I believe that any brand that wants to position itself successfully for the future has to participate in this new transformation economy and build trust with your clients and consumers. Now, what's trust? What's the definition of trust? Uh, according to the thought leader and a good friend of mine, Rachel Botsman, it is a confident relationship with the unknown. Isn't that a beautiful definition, by the way, right? A confident relationship with the unknown. And this largely begins with you as a brand advocate, as a brand ambassador, as a representative for your brand, telling a better story of why someone should go on a future journey with you, right? Anytime we've adopted a new product, solution, or technology, whether that's moving from an automobile to an airplane to ride sharing to an autonomous car, or if we've gone from fiat money to credit cards to digital payments, digital currency, and who knows what's next, somebody helped to tell us, had to tell us, a science fiction story about how that future world would be a better place. And these types of stories are emerging from brands now who are creating that future world. I want to give you some quick examples here in a collaboration we've done with Facebook in terms of how they're using uh, not only their platform, but also their partners to tell better stories about how we can create a zero friction future for consumers moving forward given some of the trends I've spoken about here.
We're really wanting to help enterprises be more efficient. Consumers want an urgency on their purchase. We just wouldn't be as strong without that kind of communication platform. So putting our sort of futurist cap on, what do you foresee or what do you imagine when you think about zero friction future? Cool. Now I'm going to launch one uh, final poll uh, just before we go into a bit of Q&A and the final cognitive skills that I want to address here today. And uh, that poll is around future promise. I'm super curious about the trend trends we have just discussed to see which one is the one that you believe will change the most or which one holds most future promise for your brand. The question, of course, is, is it the rise of hyper-local commerce? Is it do-it-yourself everything, the inner sphere, the private moat, the focus on the family and the home, the eco in economy? Is it the mentor and hero in terms of ed tech opportunities potentially? The re-emergence of slow, essence over status, coding for a contactless humanity, or is it about connectography on the fringe? We're seeing the essence over status uh, leading the charge at the moment. Um, thank you for all your engagement. 60% of you have voted so far. Essence over status is still leading the charge. Um, fascinating. Fascinating. It seems like a few people are fed up with the old uh, social media uh, status sphere uh, and seeing that essence again is becoming something that is emergent as part of the current pandemic and something we might see moving forward as well. I'm going to share those results as we move forward. Ladies and gentlemen, the final piece here today is so given the pandemic, uh, given the rise of robots and artificial intelligence, uh, maybe even systemic shifts to the labor force moving forward, uh, what are the emerging trends when it comes to how we position ourselves for the future? Well, I'm going to argue, ladies and gentlemen, that courtesy of the second renaissance, uh, there will be a massive focus on labor saving devices, technology, automation, robotic process automation and that in some ways um, we have to learn to be less spock like as humans and be more like captain kirk right we actually need to encourage the right side of our brain uh, and the reason for this is that ai uh, machine learning etc will master left brain skills faster than it will right brain skills. Logic, analysis, uh, factually based uh, information, quantitative analysis, being organized, sequential, planned and detailed. These are things that increasingly are becoming digitized and to some degree even commoditized. That's not to say that if you're, in, if you're left brain, and again, we had Michael Morgan here from HBDI, or Herman Brain Dominance Instrument, uh, that if you are left brain, you are at a disadvantage. That's not what I'm saying here today. But historically, the focus on STEM or sciences, technology, engineering, and math subjects, and even university courses, and even our rise to the top in organizations has been tilted towards one part of the brain over the other. Now, the emergence at the moment, and this is the exciting thing in the second renaissance, is the emergence of entrepreneurship, of creativity, of being able to hack something, of integrating previously existing combinatorial thinking, synthesizing, becoming increasingly interpersonal, and maybe even creating great robots who can be empathetic and really nurture a population when we need it. When we become feeling-based and actually start tapping into our humanism again, when we're increasingly kinesthetic, of course, while washing our hands, and we can tune into the emotional bonds and emotional intelligence, the real result of true uh, emotional intelligence thinking. So what we're going to see in terms of cognition moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, this is my future gazing, is that yes, while efficiency, financials, technology, past trends, performance measurements, KPIs, goals and objectives, are always going to be important. 
and methods, regulations, quality assurance, risk reduction, resources, control timing and policy are of course gonna be critical cognitive thinking skills for all of us. The real premium, ladies and gentlemen, are on things that cannot yet be digitized, right? Environmental focus, new conceptual futures, vision and purpose, thinking globally about global solutions to challenges and having a long-term strategy and scientific or science fiction narrative that people can buy into, focusing on your team's retraining and development for a new economy, creating the best virtual teams ever, right? building community relations, focusing on really loyal customer relationships, being eloquent in your communications and uh, strategy storytelling, focusing on a great culture and values in your organization and recognizing human merit where it's deserved. These are all things that we as leaders have to really nurture moving forward. Yes, we have to be aware of what those different quadrants are and what they add, but it's not about just leaning in one area or another. It's about increasingly becoming whole brain, ladies and gentlemen. And this is one of the terminologies that I think is critical. You've all heard the terminology of a renaissance or renaissance man or woman, right? This is the polymath who is actually skilled, just like Leonardo da Vinci, at a number of different things. And creativity is not just about right brain thinking either, right? We can solve problems in a variety of different ways across the four quadrants of the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. Again, happy to help you and your teams with this moving forward as well and using this psychometric tool in your future planning as well or even in career executive coaching. Happy to talk to you about that via a virtual coffee soon. Uh, but you need to really tune into all these four different areas to think about your own future education but think about how we can have a breadth of experience and expertise, but also depth. And of course, some of the ways to start doing this in your own careers and your own businesses is to think beyond just sciences, technology, engineering, and maths. To think about stempathy or STEAM, sciences, technology, arts, right? Uh, sciences, technology, engineering, arts, and uh, math becoming increasingly whole brain, cross-disciplinary thinking, becoming a Renaissance man or woman, uh, and maybe developing some new skills during this creative sabbatical that we've all been forced into, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, uh, as we do, we all pivot our businesses right here, right now. Uh, and as we do, uh, I realize that even as a futurist, I'm in the idea dissemination business. Today, I'm prevented from traveling to your conferences around the world, but of course, we help all of our clients, the likes of Facebook or Zurich, Visa, Microsoft, create and digitally disseminate their brands and their helpful transformational content to their brands, doing things like bespoke trend reports for our clients around the world as well. Think about how you will pivot moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, and think about how you can reawaken the classics just like they were done during the Renaissance. With that, I'm gonna open up for questions. Um, some of those have been coming through via the Q&A so far. Uh, and I'm gonna start with Mark Smith's question. I'm gonna answer it live. He is asking, would you expect that hyperlocal will require producers to expose their supply chains to guarantee authenticity? And how can that authenticity be validated? So we do a lot of work with brands like Certified Angus Beef in the United States. Um, the idea of from farm to table, I think is a really fascinating one, um, where previously, previous generations, you know, people trusted cigarette brands, for example, and, and the, the science behind, you know, 80% of, you know, a dentist smoke XYZ brand of cigarettes, right? We don't trust that anymore. Uh, and increasingly, we don't just trust provenance claims either. 
in fact, we want those provenance claims to be digitally verified in the interest of food security. And this is only going to keep rising as a result of the fact that we're becoming germaphobes now as well. So I would say when it comes to hyper-local brands, you really need to A, tell a really compelling story, but then also be able to digitally verify through the blockchain and other types of technologies where the food comes from. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. And in our white paper, our trend report with Microsoft on how AI is shaping the future of a, a retail renaissance, uh, certainly we have some interviews with thought leaders uh, who are facilitating these technologies for, say, Australian beef producers to prove where the beef comes from. So hopefully I've answered that question to you. Um, I've got a question here on the opinion on the role of data in business decisions when we can see how flawed data uh, can be. What is your opinion on the role of data in business decision makers? Yeah. Well, data can be flawed and it can also be um, you know, non-transparent. And we've certainly seen that in some of the reporting out, out of China, where only you know, a couple of weeks ago they you know, massively revised the, the data in terms of how many deaths there had been by about 40%. Uh, overnight and of course you know other data has been withheld in that country and then the reporting around COVID deaths and infection rates of course has been very very different uh, in different countries around the world as well. Um, I think data science, data cleansing, data analysis uh, is one of those fields where um, we have to pay a lot of attention to how data is being input, how it's being reported, and uh, hopefully new tools like AI can actually help us weed out some of the problems with data as well. Uh, as with statistics, anything can be proved, right? But I think what we're increasingly seeing is a data obsession, even amongst the, you know, the common man, woman, or however you identify, right? Where on the news today, we are getting uh, exposed to exponential charts and tuning back into you know, maths from, from school, actually becoming aware of how quickly things can move. And I think that's a fascinating part of not just the data, but also the visualization that makes uh, data tell a story in a new way that we can uh, all accept. Um, let's see, we've got uh, Su Lin Tin. Uh, the question is around thoughts on physical places and our interactions with them as we become more focused on the inner sphere and in our homes. Will physical places, offices, retail spaces, that they become less relevant? Um, I don't think it's necessarily that they become less relevant, but I think that when we invest our time into traveling into a physical place, like a retail setting, for example, that retail setting needs to be amazing, right? Because now through COVID, we've all mastered this idea of we can buy our essentials and even our clothing, etc., online, right? We've all become uh, really good at procurement, right? And sourcing things from around the world during the COVID crisis. So if we're gonna take our time to go and physically uh, expose ourselves to the elements and viruses, et cetera, um, and go and have a retail experience, that retail experience needs to be really transformational. Um, and um, my suggestion would be if the retail uh, experience is shitty, that's the French terminology, uh, then uh, you should not be a retailer anymore, right? Um, the experience, the user interface has to be amazing. What does digital intimacy in a contactless work entail? How is human warmth transferred in bits and bytes? Um, I'm going to answer that question from, uh, from Mark Smith to the best of my abilities as well. Well, I think people and our imagination, um, the way we even listen to stories um, has always been okay with having that storytelling be transmitted, not just in front of the hearth uh, or in front of the fireplace, but via screens, via great cinematography, via uh, virtual interfaces like Zoom. And what we'll see um, is a massive investment into digital broadcasting. Soon we'll be moving out of these types of spaces where we can see um, lots of dresses behind me, for example, and a little bit of mess to very, 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 very schmick and cinematographic uh, presentations. And we'll continue setting those standards uh, even higher. I think that human warmth and hopefully storytelling can also become evident in 
the webinar experience you've just had, Mark, as well, uh, we can certainly tell stories uh, in the digital sphere as well. Um, but of course, uh, as humans, um, we do need the physical touch as well. And I guess uh, short term, at least, uh, people just have to be very, very discerning with who you let touch yourself at the moment. Certainly a tough time for masseuses or, or beauticians uh, right now. But again, we'll see, just, uh, we'll, have a, we'll see how that translates into the new world. And also, I think the human touch, the old human touch, is actually going to be seen as being socially unacceptable in certain uh, areas because you're exposing other people to you know, potential transmission at least in the short term. The virus, even though it might, um, we might contain it, the viral impact on our psychology is not gonna go away very soon. And I think greetings like these ones or these ones are certainly gonna become the norm as we move forward or shaking someone's foot, for example, with your own foot. Uh, wow, lots of questions coming in. Um, let's see, do you, uh, Klaus, this is a question close to my heart. Um, it is around, do you anticipate a major change in business travel as a lot of people right now are experiencing the benefits and abilities of virtual collaboration? Yeah, I think in the, in the short term, what we are seeing is that um, it's going to seem a little bit tone deaf and for, 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 for not just for safety, but also for, for short term optics, um, you know, massively investing again in international travel from, from a corporate perspective will probably be seen as uh, irresponsible. Uh, you might see uh, government going there first to support you know, their airlines uh, because it's a you know, key part of any, any country's infrastructure. But I think it will take a little bit longer before, um, before leaders uh, will fly from around the world to get into the same room. And I'm saying as that, was, uh, that as someone who actually has an interest in, in, in leaders and, and humans meeting in the analog world, um, because it's where some of my science fiction storytelling used to take place. But I think uh, that's a, while, a way off. And if you were there at the beginning of the webinar, I do think that we'll see some of that starting to re-emerge probably halfway through next year in, in a bigger way. Uh, but it does take some, some medical innovation and hopefully some, some kind of uh, vaccine to, to get us there and feel comfortable with, with the evident risk that international travel uh, entails um, also i think um, there's just a re-examining from from cfos of you know what is essential business travel what constitutes essential business travel or can we learn by this interface now i should also add that uh, all the evidence so far shows that kids this is just uh, data from how kids learn that uh, all the digital schools that their maths and language scores are significantly lower than uh, what are considered uh, not well-performing public schools. So even uh, charter schools in, in the United States that are all digital and kids are learning maths and languages only digitally, their performance is way lower than uh, equivalent um, public schools who are learning in the analog world. So we have to ask ourselves when it comes to L&D, et cetera, don't want to shoot myself in the foot here, um, but we have to ask ourselves how much are people remembering, transforming, applying as well, uh, or is the analog interface still the best way to, to truly not just inform, but also transform? So that's how I would answer that question. Uh, Shani Puri, uh, and I know we're you know at time, if you want to hang around for a few more minutes, uh, that'd be fantastic. Um, Shani Puri, your thoughts on how we as a society will be able to support the vulnerable people in our community if physical distancing has to continue. In our context, I'm thinking of people in abusive homes and how will we evolve our ability to reach and support them. Um, very worthwhile question as well. I know in Australia, there's a massive investment from the government in, in mental health and supporting um, particularly women in, uh, in abusive relationships um, and, uh, and children in families where there's mental or, or physical abuse. And I think um, the COVID, um, COVID crisis is only gonna highlight the, the need for that. If you add on top things like drug use and people coping through alcohol and other mechanisms with, with the stressors in the particular moment now and then unemployment, 
you know, there's a there's definitely a potential for, for a time bomb there. So I think um, we're going to have to do more to in you know, every country uh, to invest in mental health and support, uh, and of course retraining, because of course jobs is where you know a lot of us get so much meaning from our work. Uh, and if you stop that, then uh, you know people take it out in different ways. I know, for example, in Italy, the statistics hold that. Um, that during the off season in soccer, there's more domestic abuse uh, as husbands don't get to let out their aggression uh, watching football, for example. And, and we can only imagine what's happening around the world at the moment, sadly. Uh, so more investment uh, and awareness needs to be uh, applied in those areas at the moment. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, there's so many good questions. I'm gonna have to, uh, Honor all of your times here, ladies and gentlemen, as well. Um, if you do have any, uh, you know, just spontaneous chat messages that you do want to send through in the chat, I'm happy to stay here for a few more minutes if you want me to. Uh, but if you do have any thank you messages, you know, that warms my very analog heart as well. If you've learned a particular thing or two today, you know, we'd love to know about it. Um, and again, uh, if there's anything that we can do for your organizations in terms of bespoke trend reports, scenario planning, uh, or Herman Brain Dominance instrument training for you, um, you know, we'd love to, love to connect with you for a virtual coffee. Certainly in the follow-up information where we'll share some digital resources with you as well. We'll also just have an option to just have a COVID hotline scenario uh, session with me as well. Uh, that's of course complimentary. Happy to chat with you and see how we can help you and your organization in these tough times as well. Uh, Daniela Dorner, our friends from, uh, from Mondi Group, as we will not be able to physically meet our internationally dispersed teams and customers still for quite some time, is there a software application you can recommend for virtual team collaboration beyond slide sharing, pulse, etc.? For uh, example, brainstorming, idea development. Um, yeah, good question. Um, there's a bunch of different brainstorming uh, softwares out there. Um, I quite like things like um, Prezi, which is what I present from P R E Z I. Again, that can be you know virtually collaborated on. Uh, I do think Slack has its merits. Uh, Microsoft is a client of ours, so of course Microsoft Teams I think is a, another great platform as well to use. Um, uh, Facebook um, or Workplace by Facebook uh, is another one, another client of ours that's doing some great work and we have some good NIB case studies on how NIB health insurance is using Workplace to engender and esprit the core digitally, um, not just in the good times, but also in the bad times as well. Um, let's see, hopefully that answers the question. Um, now, Declan Norrie is asking, the adoption of technology is commonplace in the business and social communities, and it seems that it could be the plague for Da Vinci moment for our hyper acceleration into te uh, technological world. What is the impact on this, on our human connection, both in a business and social context? Uh, let's go live on that question. Um, the adoption, let's see if I understand it correctly. The adoption of if Declan is still there, if you can just give a little bit more context on that one. The adoption of technology is commonplace in the business and social communities. And it seems that it could be the plague for Da Vinci moment for our hyper acceleration into a technological world. Uh, what, uh, what's this impact uh, on our human connection, both in a business and social context? I believe that there's a lot of things that um, the digital world can actually do to help rehumanize us. I shared an example at the beginning of this presentation of uh, terrorism and uh, a dumb truck versus a smart truck and the, the severely lower uh, or significantly lower impact on uh, the loss of human lives by containing human error and the inhumane consequences of human error. Uh, we used to think of like the physical you know, interface as the most humane, empathetic way of meeting, selling, marketing, anything. But I do think that that is, uh, is changing and maybe that technology can help us focus more on the meaningful human connection as opposed to just menial work. Certainly in some ways, uh, the likes of RPA or robotic process automation will 
take the robot out of the human to enable us to actually do more meaningful work as well, right? With, uh, and there's an interesting case of a uh, purely robot-driven restaurant in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and the entrepreneur behind it said that, hey, I want to liberate uh, people who have been flipping burgers into and helping re-educate them so they can do something more meaningful with their lives. Now, that might sound a little bit judgmental, uh, but that's his view in terms of he wants to liberate humans to actually step into their human ingenuity. Uh, and this is something that we're doing work with on, with creative brands, um, not a liberty to say which ones at the moment, uh, but creative technology brands um, in this emergent second renaissance to see how we can, through the use of technology, help liberate human creativity and interconnection as well. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, Justine Farrington, fantastic webinar. Thank you very much. That means the world. Uh, and uh, great to have you on here as well. Vicky, uh, thank you for uh, turning up as well. People from all over the world. Our country is heading towards protecting themselves for buying products from themselves. Um, I think there's an increasing, see if I've got this question right, but I think there's an in, increasing protectionism uh, in countries. We want to be, you know, like Australia and New Zealand, everyone's closing their borders. We want to be self-sufficient uh, and um, you're going to see that around the world uh, for a fairly long time, uh, I believe. And uh, uh, there's also a protectionism when it comes to supply chains. Uh, even a few weeks ago, we saw that Germany was stopping some, uh, some medical equipment from going across the border to Switzerland. Uh, and when this sort of thing happens, of course, it's a dangerous precedent in disrupting other countries. Um, supply chains and, and, and medical needs. Shani again is uh, saying, hey, um, I'm joining in from a primary school and we're in our eighth week of virtual schooling. Our whole model for teaching and emotionally connecting has changed. We're so concerned about the impact this is having on our students, teaching them and our families. What are your thoughts on how school life will be impacted? Well, I think there's, a, there's massive implications both for private and public schools. Uh, I think there will be a reconsideration if, if teaching is increasingly going to be digital, what value uh, are private schools delivering to students uh, around the world where, you know, people used to send them not just for the academics, but also for the, you know, the esprit de corps and the culture of those schools. Uh, you can tell that I live in Sydney and this is a neighborhood barbecue conversation at times. But uh, if all the teaching is just digital in the future um, and access to the world's best tutors and mentors are available, what does that mean in terms of commoditizing uh, teaching, for example? And how's the role of the teacher going to change? I think, you know, look at developments like the, you know, um, the, uh, I believe it's called the Khan Institute on YouTube and how he's sort of flipping the classroom. Uh, people might learn in new ways, but also become really vocationally savvy by having to actually not just learn academically and theoretically, but really apply things much faster. I also think that, you know, when I cast my man back to my legal days of studying law at the Australian Uni uh, National University and later on in, uh, it, at the University of Vienna, um, that there was so much theory being taught, theory that you know, went in one ear and one out the other, uh, that, you know, and also we were only taught for 13 week uh, semesters, you know, two of those a year, that's 26 weeks of the year, uh, of 52 weeks of the year. And I was like, what did we do with the rest of the time? I think education can speed up. And even uh, some colleagues of mine in the thought leadership space today, uh, who are seeing their kids come back from school, realize that for some of their kids who are sort of nine, 10 uh, years of age, they only actually have 90 minutes of effective teaching in some of those American schools a day, and that they're learning more at home now than they did uh, at school because, and no offense here, Shani, but they were describing some schools, not yours, of course, uh, as uh, you know, a combination of play dates and, uh, and childcare. So, um, you know, again, take that with a grain of salt. I'm sure your school is not like that. But can we speed up learning uh, in new ways and also hybridize our learning? Um, again, might do something for, uh, for traffic as well. Right, we're all learning from uh, you know um, fundamentalist Christians who've uh, you know spearheaded remote learning and homeschooling. Uh, 
uh, it's interesting where we have to learn things from these days, right? Because they've been mastering this for years. And of course, in Australia, we have the, the school of the air uh, as well. Uh, so distance learning and remote learning uh, has been something that's been around for a very long time. Klaus, thank you very much for hanging out today. Um, and uh, Jenny, great to have you on as well. Um, all right, Christina Black, how do you see the world opening up in the future? before a vaccine is found herd immunity or, is uh, or isolated uh, big question again you know i'm not an epidemiologist easy to say if you're swedish um but based upon what i've read so far there seems to be um not just the hammer phase of containing the virus uh, but then also the dance phase where you're going to have little spikes and maybe even second third fourth waves of, of the virus. Um, I do believe that there are certain countries, uh, including my native Sweden, which unfortunately haven't done this in a really outspoken manner, but where they're saying that, hey, you know, young fit people will have to be out there in the community and, and work and get back to work. And we're gonna have to protect our weak and vulnerable people. Uh, and that uh, that's a risk of, you know, of the virus becoming a part and ingrained part of, you know, seasonal seasonal flus etc that is something we're going to have to contend with so um ryan adrians from south africa thank you very much for having or for being on this again great to have you again recognize your name from uh, south american rugby uh, association um yeah we're all doing it tough no one's playing sports at the moment although it might be virtual soon esports on the other hand is growing all right, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's all the questions. Um, my final question to all of you uh, is the following. Imagine that it's now 2025 and on your watch, your company, your brand went belly up. What were the trends that you just missed? What were the signals that you chose to ignore? And what were the artificial resource or human resource investment decisions that you just delayed and delayed, which led to that demise? And instead, what changed will you make today to prevent that from happening i look forward to lucian's fourth birthday hopefully in sweden uh, near the time of midsummer and the solstice in 2021 uh, where the new normal is emerging and hopefully it's a world where eco is back in the economy a more sustainable future a more humanitarian and even empathetic future courtesy of new technologies that we have coded for humanity. Look forward to seeing you in that future. Ciao.